This is part nine, rebuilding a hope-filled future from the rubble of your present circumstances, how to keep the joy of your calling, part B. I'm going to read the text um, to skip ahead quickly. Three tactics of the enemy. Um, distraction, slander, and fear. We looked at distraction last week, the way they come to Nehemiah in the process of building the wall with these three different approaches. And what I'm doing in this study and last week is taking those three attacks of the enemy that are designed to keep you from completing what God has called you to complete just as surely as Nehemiah was called to complete the wall. Three tactics of the enemy, practical and simple. I want to read the text first, Nehemiah 6, 1 to 14. Now when Sanbal and Tobiah and Geshem the Arab and the rest of our enemies heard that I had built the wall... And that there was no breach left in it, no gaps, although at the time I had not yet set the doors in the gates, so they're making progress. Sanballat and Geshem sent to me saying, Come, let us meet together at Hekepharim in the plain of Ono. But they intended to do me harm. And I sent messengers to them saying, I'm doing a great work, the building of the wall, and I cannot come down. Why should, I, why should the work stop while I leave it and come down to you? And they sent to me four times in this way. And I answered in the same way. In the same way, Sam Ballot, for the fifth time, sent his servant to me with an open letter in his hand. I'll talk about that. And in it was written, quote, It is reported among the nations, and Geshem also says it, that you and all the Jews intend to rebel, and that is why you are building the wall. And according to these reports, you wish to become their king. You're here on a, on a power trip, set up your own little kingdom, and that's why you're building these walls. And you have also set up prophets to proclaim concerning you in Jerusalem, there is a king in Judah. And now the king will hear these reports because they are uh, still under captivity. And when the nation dominating them hears that there's reports of an uprising, you know, they would come and squish them. So now let us take counsel together. And then I sent to him saying, No such thing as you say has been done. You are inventing them out of your own mind. For they all wanted to frighten us. Fear is one of the things, remember? Thinking their hands will droop from the work and it will not be done. But now, O oh God, strengthen my hands. Now when I went to the house of Shemaiah, the son of Deliah, the son of Mehetabel, who was confined to his house, he said, Let us meet together in the house of God, within the temple. Let us close the doors of the temple, for they are coming to kill you. They are coming to kill you by night. But I said, should such a man as I run away? And what man such as I could go into the temple and live? I will not go in. And then I understood, saw that God had not sent him. But he had pronounced the prophesy against me because Tobiah and Sanballat had hired him, hire a prophet, rent a prophet. For this purpose he was hired, that I should be afraid and act in this way and sin. And so they gave me a bad name in order to taunt me. Remember Tobiah and Sanballat, oh my God, according to these things that they did, so also the prophetess Noadiah and the rest of the prophets want to make me afraid. All right, last week we looked at distraction. Come down, let's have this conversation, let's meet five times. They, they, they want him to leave the building of the wall for these discussions, these meetings, these dialogues. They weren't really interested in making peace with Nehemiah. They just wanted him to stop his work on the wall. And the lesson here is the joy of your calling, whatever you give leadership to, your home, your influence at work, some role you have in the church, the joy of your calling isn't just threatened by glaring sins, but by trivial distractions, things that would take you away from the primary thing God is calling you to do. Know what God is calling you to do and stay with it. These little things are what my father-in-law, in his own prairie way, he calls flies in your nose. Every once in a while, he'll, he'll phone us and he'll talk about someone in that little church in Ward and someone's left the church and Rini knows all these people and she'll say, oh, what happened? And he'll say, oh, she got flies in her nose. 
flies in your nose, uh, they're not designed to kill you, but they can sure keep you on concentrating on what you're doing. So Nehemiah knows the hearts of his critics, and his response in verse 3 is great. I'm doing a great work. I cannot come down. Why should the work stop while I leave it and come down to you? And he's not being loveless. He's not being mean. He just knows what will keep him fruitful and what will keep his life on track, and he knows how to stay with it. Distraction. All right, we looked at that last week. Now, slander. That's verses 5 through 9. When you pick it up in verse 6, an open letter, see? It is reported among the nations, and Geshem also says it, that you and the Jews intend to rebel. That's why you're building the wall. You want to become their king. I'm just editing kind of as I read. You want, you, there's, so it'll be said concerning you, these prophets proclaiming there's a king in Judah. And I said to him, nothing like you say has been done. You're inventing them in your own mind. They all wanted to frighten us thinking their hands will drop from the work, and it will not be done. Now, O oh Lord, strengthen, strengthen my hands. Verse 5 states that these words came in an open letter. The NIV translates it an unsealed letter. You've seen movies, and you know the, the, you know the, the routine where uh, letters, especially in those days, scrolls and letters were sealed with a, a soft wax seal on parchment. And it was a way of doing two things. It would be sealed, and the seal would identify who sent it. For one thing, you would see that stamp, and you would know, it's like now you have a return address on the envelope. You would know from whom that came. And the other thing, you would know if it had been tampered with, if that seal was broken. So it, the seal told you who sent it, and the seal told you if it had been tampered with and open. This was an open letter. ESV, an unsealed letter. That means two things. It means it, was, it, it would be like what we would call an unsigned letter. So the author maintained anonymity. And it means it was open. It wasn't kept from anybody. It was, it was to be dealt with publicly, designed for mass distribution, like junk email. The source is never directly quoted when you look at it. It's reported among the nations, 6a. According to these reports, 6b. Well, whose reports? Who's doing the reporting? Who's saying this? According to whose words? Well, no one knew. There's nothing here anyone could really put a finger on. There was no one to respond to. Uh, to, this day, I, to this day, I still remember the advice of my dad when I first went into the ministry. And he said, uh, always keep a tender heart and never read unsigned letters. And I'm, I'm trying to think over the years I've been in ministry how many letters I've received. And to this day, uh, I don't think I ever have. I'm sorry if, if you're here and you one time wrote me an 11-page single-spaced letter and it was unsigned. You probably think you communicated a whole bunch of stuff with me and I never read it. I open an envelope, I go to the bottom of the last page, and if somebody's name is on it, I'm happy to talk to anybody about anything. I'll phone you. We can chat. We can meet. But if someone wants a chance just to express what they want to express, but they don't want me to have a chance to respond back, I don't read them. Well, that's what this was. This was an unsigned letter. Those things can, I'm not saying they always do, but they can spawn rumor, now, Nehemiah, maybe he could have taken time and tracked down all the sources. But that would just take oodles of time and the building of the wall would stop. He knows that's exactly what the enemy wants. Nehemiah knows that while he's embroiled in witch hunting, the walls aren't going up. And so he's wise enough to keep the big picture. He's, he's more concerned. There's something really nice here. Something really nice. Uh, that shows Nehemiah's heart. He gets this letter and he reads it and he knows that there's nothing true in it. Okay? There's nothing true in it. That's very hard. It's very hard when you become aware of things that are being said and they aren't true. Let me just 
little detour here, okay? Just put a comma there, we'll come back. One day I want to do a whole message on the, the Christian and social media. I'm not on Facebook, I'm not on Twitter, I'm not on, what, what, what else is there? I, I don't even, Instagram, I'm not on anything. I'm social media free. But I, I see people who have it. And every once in a while, someone will say, look at this, and they'll show me something that they've received. And, and I'm surprised, I'm surprised at the way Christian people will say unkind things about other people, but somehow feel it isn't slander as long as you do it on Facebook or Twitter or a blog. That just as surely, see, if, I'm just using this as an illustration, this isn't the case, but just pretend. If I'm not on Facebook, and I'm not on Twitter, but someone comes and they say, look what someone said about Pastor Don, and I look at it and I go, boy, I've, I've never talked to this person, this person's never talked to me, and I know that's not true. Is Now, again, that, that's not what I'm talking about, I'm just using that as a pretend illustration. Is that, but is that slander? Hello? Of course it is. That's a wretched thing for Christian people to do. If, if it's not something you would say in love to somebody's face, then don't put it on social media. Because, 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 because Jesus reads all those. Do you know that? And so Nehemiah, back to this, he, he sees, he sees what's said about him. He knows it's not true. And the beautiful thing is, he's not going to waste one minute's time stopping building the wall to defend himself. It's like, you know what? If my reputation doesn't defend me, then my words aren't going to defend me. This is what God has called me to do. I'm going to get the walls up. And he just knows how to fight distraction, and he knows how to deal with slander. He's a person who... Listen, he's a person who, in maintaining his sense of calling and mission, he protects himself from hurt feelings. He doesn't have to defend himself. He knows what his life is about. He knows what he's doing. He's not sinless, but he has a sense of, here's where God's got me. Here's where he's called me to. Here's what I'm doing. I don't have time to run around defending myself. If you're committed to protecting your own rights, you will never amount to anything in the kingdom of God. I'll say it again. If you are committed to protecting your own rights, and our world surely is, you will never amount to anything in the kingdom of God. I was thinking about Romans 12, 17 to 21, where, where Paul says, it's not in your notes, I don't think. I was scribbling some of this stuff down before the service tonight. Repay no one evil for evil, but give thought to do what is honorable in the sight of all. If possible, so far as it depends on you, some things you can do, some things you can't, but so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. Beloved, never avenge yourselves. How often can I avenge myself? Say it. Never. Never avenge yourself. Leave it to the wrath of God, for it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. To the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he's thirsty, give him something to drink. For by so doing, you will heap burning coals on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Why are those words in the middle of a chapter dedicated to being fruitful with spiritual gifts in the body of Christ? Have you ever asked yourself that question? And the reason is... This is the number one way Satan destroys fruitful Christian service. He gets people protecting themselves against what other people say. And you can't serve Jesus and protect your reputation at the same time. If you're interested in protecting your own ego, then you don't have the kind of heart that can serve the body of Christ with spiritual gifts. 
That's the key here, I think. Nehemiah is not a selfish leader, but he has bigger issues to consider than his own reputation. It would have been easy for him to say, what these people are saying isn't true. This isn't right. Or, you know, we can, we can, we can play the more spiritual uh, role if we want to. We can frame it this way. You know, if they do this to me, they'll do it to someone else. I just owe it to others to hunt down and expose this kind of injustice. Doesn't that sound righteous? Most of you, I don't need to say this to. If you're leading anything at all, if you're going anywhere spiritually at all, if you're laboring at something to be fruitful and committed, um, you, will have, you will have critics. You will have critics. Sooner or later, you will be slandered if you are doing anything worthwhile in the kingdom of God. Determine now you're going to do what Nehemiah did. Verse 9. For they all wanted to frighten us, thinking their hands will drop from the work and it will not get done. What does Nehemiah do? Now, O oh God, strengthen my hands. Just go to God. You really don't have to talk to all the, all the critics. Go to God. Strengthen my hands. Well, Pastor Don, I don't think that I should have to take that kind of abuse. I never signed up for that. Actually, you did. Maybe nobody told you. But when you came to Christ, here's what you signed up for. First Peter 2, 21 to 23. First Peter 2, 21 to 23. For to this you have been called. You want to know the Lord's will for your life? I get asked that all the time. Pastor Don, what's God's will for my life? Well, here, let me read it to you. To this you have been called. Because Christ suffered, also suffered for you, leaving you an example that you might follow in his steps. He committed no sin. He was perfect. Neither was deceit found in his mouth. Never said anything bad. When he was reviled, he did not revile in turn. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but continued entrusting himself to him who judges justly. When you signed on and said, Dear Jesus, come into my heart, what you signed on to was... I will just entrust my life to Jesus, and when I'm treated unjustly, I won't strike back. That's God's will for your life. And everyone said, oh no, yeah, it is. The last thing, fear. Distraction, slander, fear. 10 to 14. Now, when I went to the house of Shemaiah, the son of Deleiah, the son of Mehetabel, who was confined to his house, he said, Let us meet together in the house of God within the temple. Let us close the doors of the temple, for they're coming to kill you. Nehemiah, they're coming to kill you. Me, I'm your friend. I want to protect you. Come with me into the temple. It's all a scam. They're coming to kill you by night. 11. I said, Should such a man as I run away? And what man such as I, he means he's not a priest. What man such as I could go into the temple and live? I will not go in. And I understood and saw God hadn't sent him. But he had pronounced the prophecy against me. Because Tobiah and Sambalat had hired him. For this purpose, he was hired that I should be afraid... Afraid because he said, they're coming to kill you, Nehemiah, and that fear would make him act irrationally going into the temple. Here's my question. We'll wrap up here. How did Nehemiah know that this message, this prophecy, wasn't of the Lord? How did he know? Was it that God had gifted him with some unusual discernment? Did some angel come and tell Nehemiah not to listen to these people? Well, none of that's impossible, but there's no record of that in the account. Nehemiah knew this isn't God. And this is really important. Nehemiah knew this isn't God, and he knew it by the same two means 
that are available to each one of us to know the voice of the Lord. And that's how I want to wrap up. Here's what Nehemiah knew. One, he knew it was wrong for him or anyone not of the priesthood to enter the doors of the temple. He knew that that area was reserved for the priesthood itself. How did Nehemiah know that? Well, because he read and he knew the laws of God. His life was grounded in the Old Testament scriptures, and he was spared incredible ruin and incredible danger because he saw through the plan of his enemies. He just knew God's word. Let me just urge you, let me urge you to read the Bible through every year if you can. Study it. Know what's in it. I was looking at this over and over again in, in the Psalms. Great peace have those who love your law. Nothing can make them stumble. They don't get tripped up. They don't get tripped up. They, they just, they know God's word. So, the first thing that tipped Nehemiah off as to the invalid nature of this prophecy was he, he knew the law of God. And secondly, here's the second thing that protected him. He knew that God had called him to build the wall and he knew this activity, going to meet in the temple, he knew that this would take him from the work. See verse 11? Should, should such a man as I flee... This isn't bragging. This isn't, look, I'm really special. This is just Nehemiah saying, I'm doing something for the Lord that matters and he's called me to it. This is why I'm here. This other thing, that's not for me. Should such a man as I, such a woman as I, a called person, someone with a sense of assignment from God, with so much invested, should I really flee there is a day of universal judgment coming and uh, Nehemiah just prays Lord you just remember them and he, he's not above naming all of them and saying God you just uh, I'm leaving them with you but this is how you protect yourself don't be overly concerned with protecting your own rights. Learn to leave that with the Lord. Know God's word. Know what it says. It will keep you from so much error. And know your calling. Have something that you know God has for you to do. And don't get sidetracked from it get it all backwards, don't we? We think that serving the Lord is doing him a favor. Serving the Lord is how you keep your life safe. And everyone said...